Well, we're at Preform Line Products Research and Engineering Laboratory, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the fundamentals of Aeolian vibration. You can see a conductor here vibrating. This happens to be a .857 triple AC Lisbon conductor. And right now we're vibrating it as it would vibrate due to Aeolian vibration. Now, as I mentioned earlier, what causes Aeolian vibration? Aeolian vibration happens when you have a smooth laminar wind blowing over a round cross-section. Conductors are multi-stranded, but they still approach being a round cross-section. With a trapezoidal, as we have here, we almost have a perfect round cross-section, so that can even enhance the vortex shedding more. So as the, cable, as the wind passes over the round cross-section, you get alternating forces that as the vortices are shed on the backside, and alternating forces that causes force up and down. And what happens is, if those forces happen to correlate to a natural frequency, aeolian vibration can be established. Right now, we are at a natural frequency, and we'll discuss that more in detail. Well, first off, in the laboratory, we are not driving this with wind. We are driving this with an electromechanical shaker. And what we'll do is we'll pan down the overall span so that you'll be able to see the full span length and the vibration shaker at the opposite end. Now this particular span is slightly under 100 feet long. It's actually 30 meters in length. And we are doing some different uh, fatigue and evaluation testing right now on dampers uh, from a fundamental standpoint. But for this demonstration, we're going to talk solely about some of the fundamentals of what we see with Aeolian vibration. Here you can see what we call an active part of the loop. I put my pen on the conductor so you can see a little bit of movement. You might even be able to hear it clicking away. And as I go down the line, I find a point of minimum motion. This point is known as a node. This is the point of minimum excursion. And right now, we have placed a little paper wedge on it. It's an optical indicator that gives relative amplitude. And what you can see is it's sitting still with zero amplitude. This is, as I mentioned, what we define as a node. In standing wave aeolian vibration, as we go down the line, you will see, once again, it become, the line becomes active in the active part of the loop. And as we pan down further, we can see another point of minimal motion. And that is what we call a second node. If we measure the distance from one node to the other node, we call that a loop length. And actually, me and my assistant, Nick, will do that right now. Nick, what's the overall length? 16 feet 8 inches. OK, from one node to the other node, the total length is 16 feet 8 inches. And we'll use that as a reference point. If we go down the span further, and we'll, we'll span down the span, we can see if you go down another 16 feet 8 inches, you will find another node, and so on. In fact, in this particular span, as I mentioned, it's roughly 100 feet long. We have six loops that are 16 feet 8 inches long. If you multiply it out, you're going to find out you're just about right on 100 feet. If we measure each of the six loops, and this is the sixth natural harmonic of the vibration, you'll find that each of those loops will be within probably an inch or two of each other. So it does almost perfectly balance from one loop to another. Now if we take the vibration and we find the midpoint between the two nodes, we locate a point which we call the anti-node. And this is the point of maximum excursion. Right now, well, you, have, you can see the cable vibrating. And we can probably see, if you look closely, this is an optical wedge. Your eye can't keep up with it, so it is somewhat of a, um, it misleads you, but it's an actual, actual measurement that on this optical scale that we have a cross being formed right about here. And that corresponds to 0.3 inches. Now this particular conductor is 0.857 in diameter, so 0.3 inches is roughly one-third cable diameter, which we would classify as relatively moderate levels of Aeolian vibration for this particular frequency. 
Please take note of what this vibration looks like. And what we're going to do is we're going to come back in a minute where we change the frequency and adjust the parameters of the span. I may not have mentioned earlier, but we are vibrating this conductor at 15 hertz. Now, in aeolian vibration, aeolian vibration normally occurs at wind speeds between 2 and 15 miles per hour. Using the Struhall equation, we can determine the frequencies at which we expect this conductor to vibrate at. For this particular size conductor, 0.857, we would expect aeolian vibration to occur at frequencies between 7.5 hertz all the way up to about 58 hertz. Right now we're vibrating this at a 15 hertz frequency. That corresponds very closely to a 4 miles per hour wind speed. We'll rejoin at a higher frequency and see how it affects the overall vibration. We have now adjusted the frequency and the amplitude in the span to another frequency. Right now we've adjusted the frequency to roughly 30 hertz, which would be equivalent to a, approximately an 8 mile per hour wind blowing perpendicular to the line. Now we have found through our studies, and we've studied aeolian vibration in the field for over 30 years, um, that at 8 miles per hour wind speed tends to be a range of maximum amplitude. The most severe vibration we find normally occurs at the, say, 6 to 12 mile per hour wind speeds, and 8 being pretty much in the middle of that is one area we always concern ourselves with. Right now we're vibrating at the frequency that you'd expect for this conductor to be at an 8 mile per hour wind speed. And here you can see, once again, we have a node. And I believe in the previous evaluation, this was an anti-node. We come down the span, and we find another node. And although it may not be apparent, it is a much shorter loop length. And right now, we'll go ahead and measure this loop length from one node to the other. Oops. And Nick, what's our, uh, loop, what's our loop length? Eight feet four inches. We are at 8 feet 4 inches. I believe in our first evaluation, we were at 16 feet 8 inches. So it's basically pretty much cut in half. When we take that, and we find the midpoint between the two nodes, once again, we have located the other anti-node. And here you see the vibration. We've adjusted the amplitude down um, from our vibration to approximately 0.15 inches. And I'll have a question for you to answer in just a minute regarding this. Now please note, once again, we have doubled our frequency. And by doubling our frequency, we cut the loop length in half. Now, as cables vibrate in the field, does that really matter? I can tell you that right here at this node, what's happening is the conductor is basically flexing back and forth. It's articulating at this point. And that is not causing any real damage. At the anti-node, yes, we have some minor flexing going on, but it's still not truly damaging the conductor. Where the real damage occurs is at the suspension clamp. And here I have a suspension clamp that's commonly used for uh, shield wire. Um, and where the conductor or cable, and this happens to be uh, 3 8 inch galvanized steel, comes into the suspension clamp, what happens is we grab onto the suspension, the conductor. And at that point that we grab onto the conductor, we force it to flex. So if you can imagine that this conductor is vibrating, what will happen is where my fingers come together, at this last point of contact where the keeper bites down, the conductor will flex. And when the conductor flexes, it has high bending strain. And that is the location where the maximum damage occurs and will eventually cause potential fatigue. We could have a suspension clamp mounted to this particular vibrating span. And so my question to you is, if we had a suspension clamp mounted at the end of this span, and the conductor was vibrating, and we were recording the bending that's occurring at that suspension clamp, when we compare the two scenarios of what we've just seen, the first scenario being at 15 hertz with a 16 foot 8 inch loop length and an amplitude of 0.3 inches, how does that strain or that damage from flexing compare to the higher frequency at 30 hertz 
where the loop length has been reduced to eight feet, four inches, and the amplitude has been reduced to 0.15 inches. I'll come back and we'll discuss that further.